To understand the foundations of Einstein's theory of special relativity, we must first go back to some much older ideas. The ancient Greeks believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that the Sun, planets, and stars all revolved around the Earth. This is called the Ptolemaic or geocentric worldview. During the Renaissance, it was proposed that the Earth and other planets revolve around the Sun. This is called the Copernican or heliocentric worldview. But if the Earth is constantly spinning around its own axis and revolving around the Sun, why does it look like everything around us is standing still? We don't normally feel the ground move under our feet, buildings and trees aren't constantly shaking back and forth, and we don't see flying birds getting swept away as the Earth beneath them is moving. In 1632, Galileo wrote a book where he discussed the geocentric and heliocentric worldviews. To address the issue of a seemingly stationary Earth, he came up with a thought experiment that is nowadays known as Galileo's ship. Suppose you're in a cabin below the deck of a large ship where some butterflies are flying around and some fish are swimming in a fish tank. If the ship is smoothly sailing at a constant velocity, the butterflies can still fly around the same way as if the ship were standing still. The fish can swim around like they would normally, and you can walk and jump and interact with objects the way you would normally. In modern times, you can imagine being on a moving train or a flying airplane. As long as the train or plane travels smoothly and with a constant velocity, everything inside it moves the same way as if the train or plane were standing still. This principle is nowadays known as Galilean relativity. It says that inside a system that moves with a constant velocity, the laws of physics are the same as if you were standing still. In fact, it means that in the absence of a fixed reference point, it's impossible to tell whether you're moving or stationary. If you're on a moving train, you could look outside the window to see if you're moving. This is because you're observing motion with respect to the landscape around you, which serves as a fixed reference point. But what if you're somewhere in outer space, where you can't see any stars or planets that could serve as a fixed reference point? If you're floating around in your space box, and you see another person floating in their space box, how can you tell if they are moving or if you are moving? According to Galilean relativity, it is impossible to tell, because the laws of physics are exactly the same in both reference frames. Therefore, there is no experiment that you can perform in your space box to tell whether you're moving or stationary. But if you fast forward two centuries, we discover electromagnetism, which appears to violate Galileo's principle of relativity. According to the laws of electromagnetism, a moving electric charge generates a magnetic field, this can be verified experimentally by having a current go through a wire and having the wire loop back to where it came from. The magnetic fields generated by the wire then generate a force which causes the two parts of the wire to repel each other. This means that to see if an electric charge is moving or stationary, all we have to do is check whether it generates a magnetic field or not. So if we are in our space box in outer space, we can carry some charge with us. If it doesn't emit a magnetic field, we're standing still. If it does emit a magnetic field, we're moving. We saw from our example with the moving train that if we can tell whether we're moving or not, it implies that there is some fixed reference point with respect to which we can measure our speed. In the case of the moving train, the surrounding landscape served as the fixed reference point. So if we can tell whether we're moving or not by observing the magnetic field of an electric charge, it implies that, in this case as well, we have some fixed reference point. What is this reference point? It was postulated that this fixed reference point was the ether. It was known that electromagnetic fields can propagate as waves, better known as light waves. And just like water waves need water to propagate in and sound waves need air to propagate in, it seemed reasonable to suppose that light waves must also require some medium to propagate in. This medium was called the ether and it was believed to be present throughout the entire universe. This had to be the case, because from Earth we can see stars that are light years away in all directions. This means that the starlight is able to propagate from the star to Earth, which means there must be a propagating medium in all space between the stars and Earth. So first we thought that all constant motion is relative, and there is no way to tell who is moving and who is standing still. But through electromagnetism, we found out that we are moving through the ether that is present everywhere, 
and we should be able to measure our speed with respect to the ether. It is as if we have two ships in the fast ocean that move relative to each other and we cannot tell which ship is moving by performing any experiment in the cabin below the deck of the ship. But then we realize we can measure our speed with respect to the water that is everywhere around us. We can measure the speed of the ship with respect to the water by creating water waves that approach us from different directions. If we're standing still in the water, then the waves coming from the front and from the back of the ship should approach us at equal speeds. But if we are moving forward, then the waves from the front should approach us faster than the waves from the back. In 1887, Michelson and Morley used this principle to measure our speed with respect to the ether. They built an interferometer to measure the difference between the speed of light in one direction and the direction perpendicular to it. Since the Earth is rotating around its own axis and revolving around the Sun, you would expect to find that we are constantly moving with respect to the ether, and that our direction of movement constantly changes. However, contrary to the expectations, it turned out that the speed of light was always the same in all directions, which would imply we're always standing still with respect to the ether. But this wouldn't make a lot of sense. This experimental result was one of the reasons that led Einstein to propose in 1905 his theory of special relativity. Galileo already stated the principle of relativity, according to which the laws of physics should be the same whether you are standing still or moving at a constant speed. Einstein then stated that this principle should also apply to the laws of electromagnetism. The speed of light can be derived directly from Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism, so if these equations are the same for all observers, then all observers should measure the same speed of light, just like the Michelson-Morley experiment indicated. So the Michelson-Morley experiment was one reason for Einstein to propose his theory of relativity. The other reason was that Maxwell's equations gave some suspiciously relativistic results. Whether you have a magnet moving past a stationary conductor, or a conductor moving past a stationary magnet, in both cases, the same current is generated in the conductor. In the first case, an electric field is generated by the moving magnet. But in the second case, there is no electric field because the magnet is stationary. In the first case, the electric field exerts a force on the stationary charges in the conductor. Whereas in the second case, the magnetic field exerts a force on the moving charges. Either way, in both cases, there is a force acting on the charges in the conductor, thereby creating a current. So even though different observers would disagree on whether an electric field was created, they agree on the observable outcome, namely the current in the conductor. If we assume that the principle of relativity indeed also holds for the laws of electromagnetism, it means that depending on the reference frame you consider, you do or don't see the charged particle generate a magnetic field, it completely depends on your relative motion with respect to the charge. The principle of relativity sounds simple enough. The laws of physics are the same whether you are moving or not. But this simple principle leads to very counterintuitive results. Consider for example the fact that the speed of light should be the same for different observers. If you have an observer that is stationary and somebody moves towards them at 1 meter per second, then the stationary observer sees the other person approach at 1 meter per second. If the observer also moves at 1 meter per second, then we, as an outside observer, see the two people approach each other at 1 plus 1 meters per second. If we move to the reference frame of the moving observer, the second person is moving towards them at 2 meters per second. We can consider the same situation, except the second person is now a pulse of light. A stationary person sees the pulse approach at the speed of light, namely 300 million meters per second. If the person moves towards the light source, an outside observer sees the distance between the person and the light pulse decrease by 300 million and 1 meters per second. If we now move to the reference frame of the moving person, we would still expect to see the light pulse approach the person at 300 million and 1 meters per second. After all, we're still describing the same situation, just in a different reference frame. However, according to Einstein's relativity, this is not the case. We've suggested that in the moving reference frame, light moves at 300 million and 1 meters per second, whereas in the stationary reference frame, 
light is traveling at 300 million meters per second. But according to special relativity, the speed of light must be the same in all reference frames. What that means is that an outside stationary observer sees the distance between the person and the light poles decrease by 300 million and 1 meters per second. But the moving person sees the pulse approach at 300 million meters per second. But how can both be true at the same time? Apparently, 1 meter and 1 second mean different things in different reference frames. This statement is by no means intuitive. However, the experimental facts indicate that nevertheless it must be true. The reason that something so counterintuitive can still be true is because human intuition can only be expected to be accurate in ordinary everyday situations. In extraordinary situations, such as one where objects have speeds comparable to the speed of light, it is reasonable to expect that everyday intuition fails. Let's look in more detail at how we transform between reference frames according to Galilean relativity and how we transform between reference frames according to Einstein's relativity. To understand these transformations, it's helpful to visualize them in space-time diagrams. Suppose we have two people, one standing still, one moving at one meter per second. If we introduce a grid with a time axis and a position axis, we can plot the trajectories of the two people. These trajectories are also called world lines. We see that the trajectory of a stationary person is parallel to the time axis. The trajectory of a person moving at a constant speed is a straight line with a slope that depends on its speed. Now let's introduce a second reference frame that moves along with the moving person. That is, we introduce a reference frame where the moving person is stationary. In the original reference frame, the stationary person's trajectory lies on the time axis. In the moving reference frame, the moving person is stationary, so its trajectory lies on the time axis. So we have two different plots for the two different frames, but keep in mind that they represent the same physical situation. If we have some point xt in one reference frame, we can find the expression in the other reference frame by subtracting v times t from x. Here, v is the velocity between the two reference frames. So if v equals 1 meter per second, then after 2 seconds, the position minus 1 in the stationary reference frame is the position minus 3 in the moving reference frame. This transformation of coordinates is called a Galilean boost, which can be conveniently expressed using matrix notation. We have now seen how we describe a system in two different ways by using two different reference frames. For each reference frame, we can draw a different spacetime diagram and we have a formula that tells us how the two representations are related. But we can also plot the two different coordinate systems in a single figure. To understand how this can be done, recall that an object that moves along the time axis is stationary. So if we move to a reference frame where an object moving at 1 meter per second appears stationary, then the time axis of that reference frame must lie along the world line of an object moving at 1 meter per second. If we consider a certain point in space-time, we can read off its coordinates in both reference frames. To see how our previous plot of the moving reference frame corresponds to the new figure, we can tilt the time axis so that it becomes vertical. Now we have the same figure that we obtained previously, and also in this figure we can read off the coordinates of the point in both reference frames. The Galilean transform describes how we would intuitively switch between reference frames. However, we saw that according to Einstein's relativity, switching between reference frames should preserve the speed of light, which is counterintuitive and not true for the Galilean transform. So what should the transform look like if it is to obey Einstein's relativity? Consider the world line of a pulse of light traveling at speed c. The world line is described by x equals ct. We require that if we move to a different reference frame, the pulse is still traveling at speed c, so its world line in the other reference frame should be described by x prime equals c t prime. If we draw a spacetime diagram with x along the horizontal axis and c t along the vertical axis, the world line that describes the pulse of light goes right down the middle of these two axes. We saw that if we apply a Galilean boost, we have to tilt the time axis. But if we do this, then in the new reference frame, the world line of the light pulse does not go right down the middle of the time and position axes, so its speed changed. This is what you would expect intuitively, but according to Einstein's relativity, it should not be true.
So what should our coordinate transformation look like instead? If we not only tilt the time axis, but also the position axis, then the world line of the light bulbs goes right down the middle of the two axes in both reference frames. Therefore, the speed of light is the same in both reference frames. This coordinate transformation is called the Lorentz transform. It is named after Hendrik Lorentz, who derived the transformation before Einstein did. However, Lorentz derived the transformation to explain phenomena using the ether model, not the principle of relativity. That's why it's the Lorentz transform, but Einstein's theory of relativity. So by tilting the x-axis, we can preserve the speed of light between reference frames. But what does it physically mean to tilt the x-axis? Recall that lines that are parallel to the time axis indicate points that are standing still. That is, they denote sets of events that take place at the same position, but at different times. When we go to a moving reference frame, these lines are tilted which indicates that the point that is stationary in one reference frame is not stationary in the other reference frame, which makes sense intuitively. Similarly, the position axis and lines parallel to it denote sets of events that happen at the same time but at different positions. In other words, the x-axis denotes events that happen simultaneously. In the Galilean transform, the direction of the x-axis remains unchanged. That means that if two things happen at the same time in one reference frame, they also happen at the same time if you're moving. This makes sense intuitively. But if we tilt the x-axis like we do in the Lorentz transform, it means that two events that happen simultaneously in one reference frame occur at different times in another reference frame, which is very counterintuitive. So let's look at some further consequences of the Lorentz transform. We saw that simultaneity is relative which is a direct consequence of tilting the x-axis. To see how the Lorentz transform affects the passing of time for different reference frames, let's consider a specific point in space-time. In the stationary reference frame, it corresponds to four units of time having passed. However, in the moving reference frame, less than four units of time have passed, so a stationary observer sees the clock of a moving person tick more slowly than their own stationary clock. But keep in mind that the moving person is stationary in their own reference frame and sees the other person moving. And indeed, we see in the space-time diagram that if 4 units of time have passed in the moving reference frame, less than 4 units of time have passed in the stationary reference frame. So two observers moving relative to each other see each other's clocks run more slowly. This phenomenon is called time dilation and it has been verified experimentally by observing muon lifetimes. A muon is an elementary particle with a very short lifetime. It decays in a matter of microseconds when stationary. But when they are created in the Earth's upper atmosphere by cosmic rays, they move at speeds close to the speed of light, so that they live long enough to travel through the Earth's atmosphere and reach Earth's surface. For another consequence of the Lorentz transform, Consider an object that has a size of 4 units of length. Assuming the object is stationary, it moves along the time axis in the space-time diagram. If we measure the length of the object in the moving frame of reference, we have to measure it along its position axis. When we do that, we find that for a moving observer, the length is less than 4 units of length. So objects appear shorter to a moving observer. Again, we can also consider the opposite scenario, where we have an object that is stationary in a moving frame of reference, so it moves along the tilted time axis. If we measure the length in a stationary reference frame, the length is again shorter. So observers moving relative to each other see each other's lengths shortened. This phenomenon is called Lorentz contraction. This fact too can be used to explain the extended lifetime of muons traveling at high speeds through the Earth's atmosphere. To us they appear to have a longer lifespan because of time dilation. But in the reference frame of the muon, the muon is stationary and its lifespan is not extended. It still decays in a matter of microseconds. But the muon still manages to travel through the entire Earth's atmosphere because it sees the length of the atmosphere shortened due to Lorentz contraction. Now let's consider two reference frames and the world lines of two light pulses traveling in opposite directions. We can define a region called the light cone that indicates world lines corresponding to speeds slower than the speed of light. 
If we define an event 1 at the origin and event 2 somewhere in the light cone, then there is a reference frame for which these two events lie on the time axis. That is, in that reference frame they occur at the same place but at different times. Therefore such intervals are called time-like intervals. Similarly, we can define a region corresponding to speeds faster than the speed of light. If we define a first event at the origin and a second event elsewhere in the region, then we can find a reference frame where these two events lie on the position axis. That is, in that reference frame they occur at the same time but at different locations. Therefore, these intervals are called space-like intervals. An important aspect of space-like intervals is that depending on the reference frame, the order of events may change. For example, these two events occur simultaneously in the blue frame of reference. In the green reference frame, event 2 occurs before event 1. But if we change the green reference frame, event 1 occurs before event 2. What this means is that such two events cannot be causally related. That is, event 1 cannot cause event 2 to happen, because it would mean that in another reference frame, the effect would happen before the cause. Therefore, information cannot travel between points separated by space-like intervals, which means that information cannot travel faster than light. So to summarize, we've seen that as a consequence of the Lorentz transform, simultaneity is relative, time is dilated between reference frames, lengths are contracted, we can define time-like and space-like intervals, and information cannot travel faster than light. Now let's look at how we can describe the Lorentz transform mathematically. Consider a coordinate system to which either a Galilean or a Lorentz transform is applied. If we define a fixed point in space-time, we can describe that point either in the untransformed basis or the transformed basis. The question is how we go from one representation to another, given that the reference frames move relatively to each other with some velocity v. When we describe a point with some coordinate t and x, what we're actually doing is saying how many times we should add the basis vectors together to end up at that point. For example, in the original reference frame, we have a position basis vector, x hat, and a time basis vector, t hat. To reach the point of interest, we have to go 2.6 steps in the direction of the x basis vector and 3 steps in the direction of the t basis vector. Therefore, in the original basis, the point of interest is represented by the coordinates 3, 2.6. Now we can represent the same point in the other basis. We define a transformed position basis vector x hat prime and a transformed time basis vector t hat prime. To end up at the point of interest, we have to take 3 steps in the direction of the time basis vector and 2 steps in the direction of the position basis vector. So in the transformed coordinate system, the same point of interest is represented by the coordinates 3, 2. To find out how the representations in different coordinate systems are related, we first need to find out how the basis vectors are related. Let's first express the transformed time basis vector in terms of the original basis vectors. We know that the direction of the time basis vector corresponds to the world line of an object moving with velocity v. So for each unit of time that passes, the position changes by v. The position basis vector doesn't change under a Galilean transformation, so x hat prime is equal to x hat. Now we require that a point that is described in the original coordinate system by the coordinates t and x is written as t prime times the transformed time basis vector plus x prime times the transformed position basis vector. This equation can be written using a matrix and it describes how to calculate t and x if t prime and x prime are known. But we want to go in the other direction. If we know t and x, what are the values of t prime and x prime? Mathematically we can do this by inverting the matrix, which is straightforward for a 2 by 2 matrix. From a physics point of view, we can reason as follows. Transforming to another coordinate system means moving with a velocity v. So inverting the transform means moving in the opposite direction. That is, we can apply the transformation with minus v instead of v. And indeed, we find that the inverse of the Galilean transform is found by flipping the sign of the velocity. Now let's apply the same reasoning to derive the expression for the Lorentz transform. First we find the expression for the transform time basis vector, 
But keep in mind that now we have CT along the time axis instead of just T. The transform time basis vector still points in the direction specified by x equals Vt, but since we have to write this expression in terms of Ct, we find that for one unit of time Ct, we move V over C units of position. If we define beta to be equal to V over C, then we can write the transform time basis vector as one beta. So if we move one unit of time along the original Ct axis and beta units of position along the original x axis, we end up on the transformed CT axis. Now the entire idea of the Lorentz transformation is that the X axis and CT axis are transformed symmetrically so that the speed of light is the same in all reference frames. So we find that the transform position basis vector is beta 1. We can write the coordinates of the point of interest in the original frame as a linear combination of the transformed basis vectors. This equation can be written using matrix notation and now we want to invert this equation. We can do this mathematically by applying the formula for inverting a 2 by 2 matrix. But also, we know that we should be able to invert the transformation by flipping the sign of the velocity, which means flipping the sign of beta. What we now find is that the transformation we found by mathematically inverting the matrix is different by a constant factor from the transformation we found by flipping the sign of the velocity. This is an inconsistency we need to resolve. We do this by multiplying the transform basis vectors by some factor gamma. We can now go through the same calculations and end up with two new expressions for the transformation matrix, which should be equal to each other. To have them equal each other, we require that 1 divided by gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared equals 1. We can solve this for gamma, and with that we have found the formula for the Lorentz transformation. So to summarize, when we apply a coordinate transform, we describe a fixed physical point in space-time using different coordinates. In the Lorentz transform, we tilt the time and position axes symmetrically, so that the speed of light is the same in both coordinate systems. In addition, we have to require that the inverse of the transform is given by changing the sign of the velocity. As a sanity check, we can verify that in the limit of low velocities, the Lorentz transform reduces to the more intuitive Galilean transform. First we substitute the definition of beta. Then we switch from ct to just t. If we assume that the velocity v is much smaller than the speed of light, then gamma will go to 1 and v over c squared will go to 0. And indeed, if we make these substitutions, we obtain the Galilean transform. Now that we know how to transform between reference frames in accordance with Einstein's relativity, we can see what the further implications are for the laws of physics. When Galileo said that the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames, what laws was he talking about? Let's consider a system that has several particles with different masses m. Each particle moves with its own velocity v. As these particles move around, they bump into each other which causes them to change velocity, or maybe even exchange some mass. One law of physics is the conservation of mass as the system evolves over time. The total sum of all the masses before some collisions is the same as the sum of all masses after the collisions. Galileo's principle of relativity says that this law is valid in all inertial reference frames. So if we move to a different reference frame and see the system move with some velocity v both before and after the collisions, we can check the sum of all masses before and after and verify that they're the same. This makes sense because changing the velocity of a particle shouldn't change its mass. Another such conservation law is the conservation of momentum. If we sum the momenta of all particles before some collisions and after some collisions, we end up finding the same value. Let's see whether this law is also valid in another reference frame. So let's start with the assumption that conservation of mass and conservation of momentum hold in one frame of reference. Given this assumption, can we demonstrate the validity of the conservation laws in another frame of reference? Conservation of mass holds in the new reference frame because mass doesn't change when switching the reference frame. Conservation of momentum can be rewritten by separating the terms of the summation. The sums of the masses cancel out due to the mass conservation law. We end up with the momentum conservation law in the original reference frame, which was true by assumption. Therefore, we demonstrated that if mass and momentum conservation hold in one frame of reference, they also hold in any other frame of reference.
but we derive this result by assuming that one transforms between reference frames by applying a Galilean transform. We have already seen, however, that according to Einstein's relativity, this is only approximately valid, and switching between reference frames is more accurately described using Lorentz transforms. So then the question is, are the laws of momentum and mass conservation still valid after applying a Lorentz transform? To see whether or not this is true, we must first find out how velocities transform under Lorentz transform. In a Galilean transform, the new velocity is found simply by subtracting the velocity of the new reference frame. But what do we do in the case of a Lorentz transform? Recall how the Lorentz transform symmetrically transforms time and position. The velocity is defined as the derivative of position with respect to time. And if we substitute the expressions for the transform position and time, we can cancel out the gamma from the numerator and denominator and divide both by dt. We can call dx dt v, and we can substitute the expression for beta. We have now found how the velocity is transformed under Lorentz transform. We can perform a few sanity checks to verify that this expression is indeed correct. If we assume the original velocity equals the speed of light, then the velocity changes if we apply a Galilean transform which according to Einstein's relativity is incorrect. Under Lorentz transform, however, we find that the speed of light remains unchanged, as Einstein's relativity required. Furthermore, we can verify that if all velocities are much lower than the speed of light, the Lorentz transform can be approximated as the Galilean transform, which is what we would expect. Now that we know how velocities transform under Lorentz transform, we can return to the original question. If mass and momentum conservation hold in one frame of reference, are they valid in another frame of reference? The answer is no. This brings us to the next question. How do we find conservation laws that do hold in different reference frames related by Lorentz transform? To find new conservation laws that are in accordance with Einstein's relativity, we require that the laws satisfy the following two points. Firstly, they should be valid after Lorentz transform. Secondly, in the low speed limit, the conservation law should reduce to the familiar old mass and momentum conservation laws. How do we find laws that satisfy these two requirements? We already know that the Lorentz transform reduces to the Galilean transform in the low speed limit. So if the original conservation laws are invariant on the Galilean transform and we manage to write those laws in terms of Galilean boosts, then it is reasonable to suppose that if we substitute the Galilean boost with Lorentz boosts, we find laws that are invariant under Lorentz transform. And because the Lorentz boost reduced to Galilean boosts in the low speed limit, we find laws that satisfy all the requirements. So let's write the mass and momentum conservation laws in terms of Galilean boosts. To do this, we must realize that a particle moving at a constant speed is the same as a stationary particle seen from a moving reference frame. To describe a moving particle, we need to assign to each time t a starting position x plus v times t. A stationary particle has for all times t a fixed position x. To make a particle move, we apply a Galilean boost with a certain speed v. We can denote the Galilean transform as g. If we take the time derivative, we get the vector 1v, which is the same vector that is used to describe the mass and momentum conservation laws. In other words, the vector 1v is given by the Galilean transform g applied to the vector 1, 0. We now have found how to describe the mass and momentum conservation laws in terms of Galilean boosts. If we change reference frame, we multiply both sides with another Galilean transform. The principle of relativity requires that after changing the reference frame, the conservation law should still have the same form. We can verify this by calculating the product of the two Galilean transforms and find that the result is another Galilean transform. So indeed, the conservation law has the same form in both reference frames. But if instead we change reference frames by applying a Lorentz transform, we see that in different reference frames, the conservation law has different forms, which violates the principle of relativity. So instead, let's try a different conservation law one which is found by substituting the Galilean transforms with Lorentz transforms. If we can demonstrate that the product of two Lorentz transforms is another Lorentz transform, then we have shown that the conservation law has the same form in different reference frames, 
so it is consistent with the principle of relativity. To demonstrate that the product of two Lorentz transforms is another Lorentz transform, recall the definition of the Lorentz transform. From this we see that the Lorentz transformation is any matrix of the form A, B, B, A, whose determinant is 1. If we multiply two such matrices, the outcome has the same form A, B, B, A, which we can verify by writing out the product. The determinant of the product is the product of the determinants, so the determinant of the outcome is also 1. Therefore, the product of two Lorentz transforms is indeed another Lorentz transform, which is what we needed to demonstrate. The velocity corresponding to the final Lorentz transform is found using the relativistic velocity addition formula. So now that we have demonstrated that the product of two Lorentz transforms is another Lorentz transform, we have demonstrated that the conservation law has the same form in different reference frames related by Lorentz transform, which makes the conservation law consistent with Einstein's relativity. And because we know that in the low speed limit the Lorentz transform reduces to a Galilean transform, we know that in the low speed limit the conservation laws reduce to the familiar mass and momentum conservation laws, as they should. So let's have a look at what conservation laws we have constructed. Whereas in Galilean relativity we apply the Galilean transform to the vector 1, 0 to find the mass and momentum as the conserved quantities, when we use the Lorentz transform, we find that the conserved quantities have additional factors of gamma and gamma over c. Since the speed of light c is a constant that is the same in all reference frames, we can multiply the conserved quantities by c to find quantities that are also conserved in all reference frames. So let's look at the relativistically conserved quantities. How can we interpret them? Let's look at the first entry by writing it out using the definition of gamma. To relate this quantity to something that we may already be familiar with from non-relativistic Newtonian physics, we consider the low speed limit. This allows us to tailor expand gamma to first order in terms of beta squared. If we substitute the definition of beta and multiply both sides with c, we find that small non-zero speeds create a term that is equal to the kinetic energy that we know from Newtonian physics. This means we can interpret the first term as the amount of energy an object has even when it isn't moving. It implies that mass and energy are in fact equivalent. The experimental evidence for mass-energy equivalence can be found in nuclear reactions. When two nuclei react, the total mass decreases, which is called the mass defect. At the same time, energy is released, and the relation between the missing mass and the released energy follows the formula E equals mc squared. Another phenomenon that illustrates the mass-energy equivalence is pair production or annihilation. If a photon, which is massless, has enough energy, it can generate a pair of particles with mass, for example an electron and a positron. If an electron and positron meet and annihilate each other, they release an amount of energy that is equivalent to their total mass. So the first entry of our vector of conserved quantities can be interpreted as the energy divided by c, where the total energy is due to both mass and motion. The second term is the relativistic momentum, which differs from the Newtonian momentum by a factor gamma. In earlier interpretations of Einstein's relativity, one typically spoke of the relativistic mass. According to Einstein's relativity, relativistic mass is conserved, and momentum that is defined using the relativistic mass is conserved. For higher velocity, the relativistic mass increases, so as an object approaches the speed of light, it becomes increasingly more difficult to accelerate it, so that it cannot be made to move faster than light. However, more recently it was decided that the concept of relativistic mass should be abandoned. Nowadays it is generally agreed that an object only has one mass, which is the same in all reference frames, and the terminology such as rest mass and relativistic mass have become obsolete. Instead, the concept of proper time is used to interpret relativistic momentum. The proper time tau is defined as the time in the reference frame of the particle. Therefore, it doesn't change when switching reference frames, as opposed to the regular time t, which does change between reference frames. The relativistic momentum is found by taking the derivative of position with respect to proper time. Using the chain rule, we find that this derivative is equal to the velocity times dt d tau, and from the Lorentz transform it follows directly this is equal to gamma. When deriving the relativistically conserved quantities, 
we made use of the fact that a moving particle is a stationary particle seen from a moving reference frame. This allowed us to write the conservation laws in terms of Galilean transforms, which we later substituted with Lorentz transforms. Note that when we took the time derivative, it was the derivative with respect to the time in the particle's reference frame. When applying Galilean transforms, the time is the same in all reference frames, but when applying Lorentz transforms, times are different in different reference frames. Therefore, when taking the time derivative, it is more appropriately denoted as the derivative with respect to the proper time tau, rather than t. So we see that in our derivation of relativistic conserved quantities, we indeed made use of the concept of proper time. When deriving the conservation laws, we worked with vectors to which we applied the Galilean or Lorentz transforms. This vector contained a time component and a position component, but in general there will be three position components, x, y, z. We then get a vector with four components. We derived another such vector which contains an energy component and a momentum component. We already saw that the position vector transforms according to Lorentz transform, which can be written in matrix notation. We found the momentum vector by applying a Lorentz transform to the vector 1, 0. The same momentum vector in another reference frame must then also be some Lorentz transform applied to 1, 0. And that Lorentz transform can be written as the original Lorentz transform times another Lorentz transform to switch between the reference frames. Therefore, the momentum vector, just like the position vector, transforms according to Lorentz transform. These four-dimensional vectors, whose representations in different reference frames are related by Lorentz transform, are called four vectors. So in summary, according to the principle of relativity, the same laws of physics must be valid in all reference frames. If we switch between reference frames by using a Lorentz transform instead of a Galilean transform, the familiar mass and momentum conservation laws are not the same in all reference frames. So we need to define new conservation laws such that they hold in all reference frames related by Lorentz transform, and they must reduce to the familiar mass and momentum conservation laws in the low speed limit. To find these new laws, we wrote the old laws in terms of Galilean transforms and then substituted them with Lorentz transforms. The new laws we found reveal that mass and energy are equivalent, and we defined relativistic momentum and relativistic energy. These new quantities can be put in a four-dimensional energy-momentum vector, just like time and position can be put in a four-dimensional vector. Both these vectors transform between reference frames according to Lorentz transform, which makes them four vectors. By now we've seen that special relativity is all about switching between reference frames. Switching to a different reference frame means applying a basis transformation. And in special relativity, the representations of various vectors in different reference frames are related by the Lorentz transform. Examples of such vectors include the time position vector and the energy momentum vector. But generally speaking, different vectors may transform differently under a basis transformation. To illustrate this, consider the following example. Suppose you're walking to the right, and as you walk further, the temperature steadily increases. Let f be the function that describes the temperature as a function of position. Let's say that the temperature increases by 0 0.001 degrees with every meter you move to the right. If we move 1000 meters to the right, then we experience an increase of 1 degree. Now let's apply a basis transformation. Instead of measuring distance in meters, we measure it in kilometers. Per kilometer that we move to the right, the temperature increases by 1 degree we move one kilometer to the right. Then we experience a one degree change in temperature. Now let's examine how the quantities changed under this basis transformation. We made the basis vector longer because we went from meters to kilometers. The numerical value of the temperature gradient vector increased as well. It went from 0 0.001 to one. So this value varied in the same way as the basis vector, which is why we call it a covariant vector. The value of the position vector, however, decreased from 1000 to 1. So this value varied in a way contrary to the basis vector, so we call it a contravariant vector. The inner product of the covariant gradient vector and the contravariant position vector remained unchanged during this basis transformation, so we call it an invariant quantity. So we've seen that different quantities can transform differently under a basis transformation.
There are contravariant factors which change oppositely to the basis factors. There are covariant factors which change in the same way as the basis factors. And the inner product of a contravariant and covariant quantity gives an invariant quantity, which doesn't change when you change the basis factors. Now let's look at a more complicated two-dimensional example. Suppose we have two basis factors x hat and y hat, which are orthonormal, which means they are perpendicular to each other and both have length 1. Suppose we have another basis, which is given by the basis factors a hat and b hat, which are not orthonormal. We can describe a hat in the xy basis as 1, 1 half, and we can describe b hat in the xy basis as 1, 2. Now let's suppose we have a position vector v, which we can describe in the xy basis as 2, 2. And we want to know how we can describe it in the AB basis. The vector V is a position vector, so we know it's contravariant. To find out how it transforms, we need to find the coefficients A and B such that the linear combination of basis vectors gives V. We can plug in the expressions for A hat, B hat and V in the XY representation. This gives us a matrix equation for the vector AB. Let's call the matrix that contains the basis vectors B. We see that to go from the xy basis to the ab basis, we have to multiply the xy representation of v with the inverse of b. Because b, which contains the basis vectors, is inverted, it confirms our observation that v is a contravariant vector, which changes contrary to the basis vectors. Now let's look at the transformation of a covariant quantity, such as the gradient of some function f. To express the gradient of f in the AB basis in terms of the gradient of f in the XY basis, we can apply the chain rule. The gradient in the XY basis is given by df dx and df dy, and the gradient in the AB basis is given by df dA and df dB. To go from the XY basis to the AB basis, we need to know dx dA, dy dA, dx dB and dy dB. We can put all these quantities in a matrix equation. Now let's find the values of the matrix entries. dx dA describes how far we move in the x direction if we change the coefficient of the a hat basis vector. This value is given by the x component of the a hat basis vector, which is 1. Similarly, dy dA is the y component of the a hat basis vector, dx dB is the x component of the b hat basis vector, and dy dB is the y component of the b hat basis vector. If we compare the matrix we found now to the matrix we found for transforming the contravariant vector, we find that they are each other's transposes. So we find that to transform the gradient in the xy basis to the gradient in the ab basis, we need to multiply with b transpose. Because we now multiply with b and not its inverse, we confirm that the gradient of f is a covariant vector, which changes along with the basis vectors. We can now see what happens if we take the inner product of the gradient vector and the position vector in the AB basis. We can write it as a matrix product of the gradient transpose with B. We can substitute the expressions of the vectors in the XY basis and we find that the basis transformation matrices B cancel out. So indeed, the inner product of a covariant and contravariant vector is invariant under basis transformation. Now that we know the transformation rules for covariant, contravariant and invariant quantities, let's turn to another question. How do we calculate the length of a vector in different bases? In an orthonormal basis, we can use the familiar Pythagorean theorem, which can be written as the inner product of the vector with itself. But if the basis is not orthonormal, then using Pythagoras will give the wrong answer. So then what would be the correct way to calculate the length in a non-orthonormal basis? We can do it straightforwardly by transforming the vector to an orthonormal basis and calculating the length there using Pythagoras, so by taking the inner product with itself. If we write out this expression in the AB basis, we find that there is the matrix B transpose times B. This gives what is called the metric tensor, which describes how to calculate the length in the AB basis. Note that we take the product of two contravariant position vectors and a metric tensor which is the product of two covariant matrices containing the basis vectors. The product of two contravariant and two covariant quantities results in an invariant squared length. Similarly, we can ask how we can calculate the length of a gradient vector in an orthonormal basis.
Again, we can transform the vector back to an orthonormal basis and calculate the length there by taking the inner product with itself. In this case, the invariant squared length is obtained by taking the product of two covariant vectors with the metric tensor that is the product of two contravariant matrices containing the basis vectors. So we have found the expression for the covariant metric tensor and contravariant metric tensor in a certain basis. Note that the metric tensors are symmetric because they are the product of a matrix with its own transpose. We also see that they are each other's inverses. Previously we saw that the inner product of a covariant and contravariant vector gives an invariant quantity. For example, the inner product of a gradient vector and a position vector is invariant. Now we have an invariant squared length, so we should also be able to write it as an inner product of a covariant vector with a contravariant vector. If we multiply the metric tensor with a contravariant vector, we get a covariant vector and the inner product with the contravariant vector yields the invariant squared length. So with the covariant metric tensor, we can convert a contravariant position vector to a covariant position vector. Similarly, with the contravariant metric tensor, we can convert a covariant vector to a contravariant vector. Now we can look at the role of the metric tensor in special relativity. Let's assume the squared length of a spacetime vector is found using some metric tensor G. By applying the Lorentz transform, we describe the same vector in another reference frame, where we can find the length using some metric tensor G prime. The squared length should be the same in both reference frames, as we saw previously. Furthermore, it is a fundamental principle of special relativity that all reference frames are equivalent. Therefore, G must equal G prime. Also, we saw previously that the metric tensor must be symmetric. With these three pieces of information, we can find an expression for the metric tensor in special relativity. We equate the expressions for the squared length in different reference frames. We use the fact that g prime equals g and that the spacetime vector in the primed reference frame is found by applying the Lorentz transform to the spacetime vector in the unprimed reference frame. Since this equation must hold for any spacetime vector, we find that g must equal lambda transpose times g times lambda. If we write G as a matrix with some unknown entries A, B, C and D, and we write the Lorentz transform in matrix notation, we find an equation that must hold for all beta. By writing out the matrix products, we find equations for A, B, C and D. A, B, C and D must be independent of beta, because the metric tensor must be the same in all frames of reference. So if there's 1 minus beta squared in the denominator, then the numerator must be a multiple of 1 minus beta squared. From this it follows that b plus c equals 0 and a plus d equals 0. Therefore, the metric tensor must be of the form a, b, minus b, minus a. And because the metric tensor must be symmetric, b must equal 0. a can be anything, but for simplicity we choose a equals 1, which results in the tensor with 1 and minus 1 on the diagonal. There also exists another convention, where the 1 and minus 1 are interchanged. If we now consider three spatial dimensions x, y and z, we get the Minkowski metric tensor, which has on the diagonal 1 for the time component and minus 1 for the spatial components. This is called the mostly minuses convention, but in other cases the mostly pluses convention may be used, where the 1 and minus 1s are interchanged. If we write out the matrix products, we find that the squared length equals ct squared minus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This expression is called the spacetime interval, and it has the same value in all reference frames for a fixed spacetime vector. Similarly, we can find the invariant squared length of the energy momentum vector, which is equal to e over c squared minus p squared, where e and p denote the relativistic energy and momentum. In the rest frame, the velocity equals zero, so the squared length of the energy momentum vector equals m squared c squared, and because the squared length is invariant, this must be the length in all reference frames. We can rewrite this expression to find that e squared equals m squared c to the fourth plus b squared c squared. This relation can be used to argue that for a massless particle, such as a photon, the energy must equal its momentum times the speed of light. Now that we have introduced different types of quantities that change differently when changing reference frames, it would be convenient to have a notation that clearly distinguishes such quantities.
A contravariant vector is denoted using a superscript. The different values that the superscript can take correspond to the different components of the vector. A covariant vector is denoted using a subscript. A covariant vector is obtained from a contravariant vector by applying the metric tensor. As a result, the spatial components of the covariant vector have a minus sign compared to the corresponding contravariant vector. To remember that covariant vectors have the subscript, you can remember that co goes below. The inner product of a covariant and contravariant vector gives an invariant scalar. In Einstein notation, it is understood that if an index is repeated, it is summed over, so it denotes an inner product. So for example, x sub mu x superscript mu gives the spacetime interval. The covariant metric tensor is used to change a contravariant vector into a covariant vector, so it lowers the index of a vector. So keeping in mind that repeated indices are summed over, x sub mu equals the covariant metric tensor times x superscript nu. Similarly, the contravariant vector x superscript mu equals the contravariant metric tensor times the covariant vector x sub nu. We know that the covariant and contravariant metric tensors are each other's inverses. And because the Minkowski metric tensor has one and minus ones on the diagonal, the tensor and its inverse are the same. So the covariant and contravariant metric tensors both change the sign of the spatial component. We can also define the covariant foregradient, which is a vector containing the derivatives with respect to the time and spatial coordinates. If we take the inner product of the covariant foregradient and the contravariant vector, we get a Lorentz invariant quantity that can be written as the time derivative of the temporal component plus the divergence of the spatial component of the four vector. We can also define the inner product of the covariant and contravariant foregradient. This is also denoted as a square, and the operator is called the d'Alembertian, which is Lorentz invariant. Writing out the inner product gives the second derivative to time minus the Laplacian. This is the same operator that occurs in the wave equation. So we've seen that we can write four vectors using a superscript or subscript, and the representations of these four vectors in different reference frames are related by Lorentz transform. The advantage of this notation is that we can easily identify quantities that are Lorentz invariant by looking for repeated upper and lower indices. And Lorentz invariant quantities are important because the laws of physics should be Lorentz invariant. So in summary, we've seen that there are contravariant vectors, such as position vectors, that transform contrary to the basis vectors. Covariant vectors, such as gradient vectors, transform in the same way as the basis vectors. Taking the inner product of a contravariant with a covariant vector gives an invariant quantity, which doesn't change on the basis transformation. To assign a definite length to a vector, independently of the basis, we introduce the metric tensor. Therefore, the vector length becomes an invariant quantity. So the metric tensor can be used to change a contravariant vector to a covariant vector, so that the inner product of a contravariant vector with its covariant counterpart is an invariant length. In special relativity, all reference frames must be equivalent, so the metric tensor must be the same in all reference frames. Given that the vector representations in different reference frames are related by Lorentz transform, we can derive that to find the length of a spacetime vector, we must use the Minkowski metric. We denote contravariant vectors using a raised index and covariant vector using a lowered index. So the metric tensor can be used to raise or lower indices. It is understood that if indices are repeated, they are summed over. This way, we can easily spot which quantities are invariant under Lorentz transformation, which is important because physical laws must be the same under Lorentz transformation. Let's go back to the foundations of special relativity. It was basically Galileo's principle of relativity applied to the laws of electromagnetism. So let's look in more detail at how electromagnetism is described in special relativity. Let's first start with Maxwell's equations. The first Maxwell's equation is Gauss's law, which states that the divergence of the electric field is proportional to the electric charge density. So if you look at the electric field lines through a surface enclosing an electric charge, then there is a net divergence. The second law says that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, which means there are no magnetic charges, 
Of course, there are sources of magnetic fields, but they always come with both a magnetic north pole and south pole. There are no separate magnetic north charges or south charges, like there are electric positive and negative charges. That means that if we look at the magnetic field lines through a closed surface, there are as many field lines coming in as there are field lines going out, so there is no net divergence. The third Maxwell's equation is Faraday's law. It states that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. This principle is used in bicycle dynamos to generate power. The bicycle's wheel makes a magnet rotate, which causes the magnetic field to change continuously. This generates an electric current that is used to power the bicycle light. The final Maxwell's equation is Ampere's law. It states that an electric current generates a magnetic field that curls around it. This can be verified by observing the deflection of a compass needle near a current carrying wire, as was done by Ørsted in 1820. However, these equations are incomplete, as they contain an error. It is a mathematical fact that the divergence of a curl always equals zero. From Ampere's law it follows then that the divergence of the current density must always be zero. But that doesn't make sense. If you have a bunch of electric charges and they move outwardly, then we can define an enclosing surface through which there is a divergent current density. At the same time, the amount of charge within the enclosed volume decreases. So we would expect that the divergence of the current density is equal to the rate at which the charge density decreases. This is known as the continuity equation. So let's see how we can fix Maxwell's equations so that they agree with the continuity equation. The divergence of the curl of the magnetic field equals zero, which must be equal to the divergence of the current density plus the rate of increase in charge density. We know from Gauss's law that the charge density is proportional to the divergence of the electric field. From this it follows that we must add an extra term to Ampere's law. This term says that a changing electric field creates a magnetic field. This can be observed by running an alternating current through a capacitor. Even inside the capacitor, where no charge is flowing, a magnetic field forms as if there were a current. This magnetic field is created by the continuously changing electric field. When Maxwell formulated these equations, including the correction to Ampere's law, he demonstrated the existence of electromagnetic waves. Let's assume we're in a vacuum, so the charge density and current density are both zero. Then we can take the curl of both sides of Faraday's law and rewrite the curl of the magnetic field using Ampere's law. Similarly, we can take the curl of both sides of Ampere's law and use Faraday's law to rewrite the curl of the electric field. Now we can apply a vector identity to rewrite the curl of the curl of a field. From Gauss's law, it follows that the divergences of the electric and magnetic field are zero. We can move all the terms to one side and note that both the electric and magnetic field obey a wave equation with some velocity c that turned out to be the speed of light. So according to Einstein's theory of relativity, these Maxwell's equations should be valid in all frames of reference. We saw that Maxwell's equations say that moving charges generate a magnetic field. But depending on your reference frame, you may or may not see the charges move, so you may or may not see a magnetic field. So different reference frames observe different magnetic fields. One may therefore ask, how do electromagnetic fields transform between reference frames? To answer this question, recall that we already know how the spacetime coordinates of a particle transform between reference frames. Since the particle's trajectory is basically a sequence of spacetime coordinates, we know how a particle's trajectory transforms between reference frames. If the trajectory of a charged particle is defined by the electromagnetic forces acting on it, then we can infer from the transformed trajectory what the transformed field should look like. So let's see how electromagnetic fields exert forces on a charged particle. A charged particle in an electric field experiences a force in the direction of the field. So if you apply a voltage between two plates so that an electric field is created, then a charged particle is accelerated from one plate to another. If there is a particle moving in a magnetic field, then the magnetic field applies a force that is perpendicular to the particle's velocity. This causes the particle to move in circles. If we combine these two forces in one equation, we get the Lorentz force law, 
Using the electric field to accelerate particles and magnetic field to deflect them are principles used in for example cathode ray tubes or cyclotrons that are used in particle accelerators. We can write the Lorentz force law in matrix notation. We can write the force as the time derivative of momentum and velocity as the time derivative of position. Note that on the right hand side we find the position 4 factor if we multiply the first component with the speed of light c. On the left hand side we only have the momentum component of the momentum 4 factor, but the energy component is missing. So let's find the missing energy component of the 4 factor. A particle that is accelerated by a force has its kinetic energy increased by the force times the distance traveled along the direction of the force. If we substitute the expression for the electromagnetic force, we find that the magnetic force does not increase the kinetic energy, because the magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity. Only the electric force increases the kinetic energy. We can use this expression to extend the matrix equation so that now we have the position 4 vector on the right and the momentum 4 vector on the left. By multiplying both sides with dt d tau, where tau denotes the proper time, we now have a derivative with respect to tau instead of t, which is independent of the reference frame. We can now write the equation using index notation. The contravariant position vector is related to the contravariant momentum vector by a tensor with one contravariant index and one covariant index. Now let's see what happens when we move from one reference frame to another. When we go to a different reference frame, we know that the momentum 4 vector and position 4 vector transform according to Lorentz transform. Relativity requires that the validity of the Lorentz force law in the new reference frame should follow from the Lorentz force law in the old reference frame, because the laws of physics should be the same in all reference frames. This is true when the matrix containing the fields is transformed between reference frames as follows. It is multiplied with the Lorentz transform matrix from the left side and with its inverse from the right side. Because if we substitute this expression in the Lorentz force law for the new reference frame, we recover the Lorentz force law in the old reference frame. So given this transformation rule, the validity of the force law in one reference frame implies its validity in the other reference frame, as relativity requires. If we write out the transform matrix, we find how each field component transforms between reference frames. We see that indeed, if in one frame of reference there is no magnetic field, an electric field can create a magnetic field. More generally, we see that the electric and magnetic fields transform together as one quantity that is called the electromagnetic field tensor. The electromagnetic field tensor that we found by writing the Lorentz force law in matrix notation seems to display some symmetry, but it's not quite completely symmetric. To make the tensor fully anti-symmetric, we can raise one of the indices using the metric tensor. Applying the metric tensor means we change the sign of the last three columns, and by doing so, the tensor is fully anti-symmetric. Describing the electromagnetic field in this way is useful to understand how the fields transform between reference frames but it seems to have lots of redundancy. The tensor contains 16 entries, but we're only describing 6 field components. One may wonder whether there's a more elegant way to describe the electromagnetic field. One way to describe electromagnetism is by using potentials instead of fields. To introduce the concept of potentials, let's first consider the case of electrostatics. That is, we assume the charge and current distributions don't change over time so the fields don't change over time either, which means we can set the time derivatives of the fields equal to zero. The curl of the electric field is then zero, and it is a mathematical fact that the curl of a gradient is always zero as well. It turns out that we can write the electric field as the gradient of a scalar function that is called the potential. However, as a matter of convention, the field is defined as the negative gradient of the potential. This way, the field points in the direction in which the potential decreases. So if we have a point charge that emits an electric field, which is described as a vector field, we can instead define a scalar function whose gradient indicates the field. The advantage of this approach is that we reduce the number of variables. Instead of working with three components of a vector, we now only have to work with a single scalar. Moreover, we can think of the potential function intuitively as a landscape. A charged particle will move along the electric field lines, so it moves along the slope of the potential function. This is similar to a ball rolling downhill in a hilly landscape. Note that we can add any arbitrary constant to the potential function and still obtain the same physical field. 
Now we can ask if we can similarly define a potential for the magnetic field. We know the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, and it is a mathematical fact that the divergence of a curl is zero. It turns out we can write the magnetic field as the curl of some vector potential. Because the curl of a gradient is zero, we can add any gradient of a function to the vector potential to obtain the same magnetic field. While the advantages for the electric potential were clear, it isn't quite as obvious what the benefits of a magnetic potential would be. It does not reduce the number of variables, since the potential is still a vector field just like the original magnetic field. And there is no intuitive landscape picture like there is in the case of the electric potential. So why should we bother with the magnetic vector potential? Richard Feynman once remarked that the magnetic vector potential is not just a mathematical construct, but in fact a physical quantity that is realer than the magnetic field. It turns out that if you want to describe a charged particle in an electromagnetic field quantum mechanically, one has to incorporate the electromagnetic potentials in the Schrödinger equation rather than the fields. Moreover, in the Aharonov-Bohm experiment, it was demonstrated that a quantum mechanical particle experienced electromagnetic influences in a region where the fields were zero, but the potentials were non-zero. These observations indicate that there is something significant about the electromagnetic potentials. Moreover, we will see that if we have charge and current distributions that change over time, then the potentials change over time in a straightforward manner, whereas the fields change in a way that is much less obvious. Also, we saw that if we switch between reference frames, the fields transform as an anti-symmetric tensor that contains quite some redundant entries. The potentials, on the other hand, transform much more elegantly as a four-factor. So let's have a further look at electromagnetic potentials to better understand their benefits. We already saw how the potentials work in the electrostatic case, where the sources and fields don't change over time. Now let's look at the more general case of electrodynamics, where the sources and fields do vary in time. Gauss's law for magnetism is still the same, so our definition for the vector potential is also the same as in the electrostatic case. Faraday's law, however, now contains the time derivative of the magnetic field, which was absent in the electrostatic case. We can write the magnetic field in terms of the magnetic vector potential. Moving the terms to one side and taking the curl outside the brackets allows us to identify a function whose curl must be zero. Therefore, this function can be written as a gradient of a potential. From this it follows that the electric field is given by the negative gradient of the electric potential minus the time derivative of the magnetic potential. Just like in the electrostatic case, we can change the potential in such a way that they still give the same fields. This is called a gauge transformation. If we add the gradient of a function f to the magnetic potential, it still gives us the same magnetic field because the curl of a gradient vanishes. If we apply such a transformation to the magnetic potential, then the electric field is altered because the electric field depends on the time derivative of the magnetic potential. To make sure that the electric field doesn't change under the gauge transformation, we must subtract the time derivative of f from the electric potential. So we now know how to calculate the fields from the potentials, and what degrees of freedom we have in choosing the potentials. Now let's write Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials to see how the potentials behave. The potentials were defined in such a way that Gauss's law for magnetism and Faraday's law are satisfied automatically. So we only need to be concerned with Gauss's law for electric fields and Ampere's law. We can substitute the expression for the electric field in Gauss's law and expand the brackets. Similarly, we can substitute the expression for the magnetic field and the electric field in Ampere's law, expand the brackets on the left side using a vector identity, expand the brackets on the right side, and move some terms to the left. We now have two equations with the potentials on the left side and the sources on the right side. It is conventional to multiply both sides of the equations with a minus sign so that the source terms are negative. Now we have two equations that describe the behavior of the potentials but these equations look rather complicated. Now is a good time to make use of the fact that the gauge transformations give us a degree of freedom that allows us to eliminate some terms and thereby simplify the equations. One choice of the gauge is called the Coulomb gauge, where the vector potential is chosen such that its divergence vanishes. This simplifies the equation involving the charge density, but the equation with the current density remains complicated.
Another choice of the gauge is the Lorentz gauge, which sometimes is written with a T in reference to the Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorentz, but usually without a T in reference to the Danish physicist Ludwig Lorentz. In the Lorentz gauge, the time derivative of the electric potential cancels out the divergence of the magnetic potential. Note the similarity with the continuity equation for charges and currents that we saw earlier. With this choice of gauge, we find that the electric potential obeys a wave equation where the charge density is the source, and the magnetic potential obeys a vectorial wave equation where the current density is the source. So the potentials obey inhomogeneous wave equations, with a propagation speed that is equal to the speed of light. So what that means is that if the source distributions change over time, then the change in the potentials propagate with the speed of light. Let's see what this means using a simple example. If we have a point charge, then we know from electrostatics that it generates a potential of a certain form. But now let's say that before time t equals zero there is no charge and the potential is zero. If at time t equals zero the charge pops into existence, does the entire potential pop into existence at the same time as well? This would contradict the claim of special relativity that information cannot travel faster than light. Instead, we saw from the wave equations that the potentials travel at the speed of light. So if an observer is some distance away from the source, they see the potentials that the source emitted some time ago. This is similar to the idea that we don't see the sun as it is currently, but as it was 8 minutes ago, because it takes 8 minutes for the sunlight to travel to Earth. So if before time t equals zero there is no charge, and at time t equals zero a charge pops into existence, then it emits a potential at the speed of light. After a long time, the potential is given by the charge divided by the distance to the charge. If the point charge exists only for a brief instance in time, then there is a sort of pulse of potential traveling radially outwards at the speed of light. Mathematically, this function is called the Green's function of the wave equation which can be regarded as an impulse response. The Green's function is useful because if you interpret the time-varying source distribution as a series of impulses, you can write the generated potential as a sum of impulse responses. If the observer is some distance away from a certain point in the source distribution, they see the potential that the source emitted at the retarded time. We can sum all the retarded potentials emitted by all the points in the source distribution. This gives the total potential that is observed at a certain location r at a certain time t. So to summarize, if we have some source distribution that varies in time and we want to know the potential at a certain time and location, we look at what point sources there were at the retarded time. At that time, the source emitted information that traveled at the speed of light and now reaches the observer. The summation of the contributions from all point sources at their respective retarded times gives the total potential at the observation point. We can ask whether a similar straightforward relation holds for the fields. That is, is the field at a certain observation point found simply by looking at the source at the retarded time? The answer is no, and we can verify this by calculating the fields from the potentials that we just derived. If we compute the electric field from the electric and magnetic potentials, we find an expression that is much more complicated than the one for the potential and it also involves the time derivatives of the sources. So we see that potentials are generated more straightforwardly than fields. This is one of the reasons to regard potentials as more fundamental than fields. Another reason is that potentials transform much more elegantly between different reference frames. We already saw how fields transform between reference frames, namely as an anti-symmetric 4x4 tensor. We know what this transformation looks like, so if we write it in terms of potentials, we can figure out what the transformation of potentials looks like. We can write the definition of the field tensor in a certain frame of reference in terms of potentials. Now let's introduce the potential vector and recall what the gradient for vector looks like. We can write each entry of the field tensor in terms of these vectors. Once we have done this for all entries, we find that we can write the field tensor in a very compact manner that also explicitly shows its anti-symmetry. From this expression, we can infer how the potential vector transforms between reference frames. We already know how the fully contravariant field tensor transforms, namely by applying the Lorentz transform to both its indices. We can substitute the expression we found for the field tensor and expand the brackets. We know that if we apply the Lorentz transform to the gradient vector, it gives the gradient vector in the new reference frame. 
We also know from the definition of the field tensor that in the new reference frame it can be written using the transformed gradient and the transformed potentials. Comparing the last two equations leads to the conclusion that applying the Lorentz transform to the potential vector gives the potential vector in the new reference frame. In other words, the potential vector is a 4 vector. So we've seen how potentials are generated more straightforwardly than fields. And now we also saw that potentials transform as a 4 vector, while the fields transform as an anti-symmetric tensor. With the introduction of the potential 4 vector, we can now look at how we can rewrite Maxwell's equations more compactly using 4 vectors and Einstein notation. Let's first recall what we have already derived. We know that the continuity equation for charges and currents must hold, and we assume the potential satisfy the Lorentz gauge, which has the same form as the continuity equation. Assuming the Lorentz gauge, the potential satisfy inhomogeneous wave equations where the charge and current densities are the source terms. To rewrite these equations, recall the 4 gradient and the 4 potential. We can now write the Lorentz gauge more compactly using Einstein notation. Similarly, we can introduce a vector containing the sources to write the continuity equation more compactly. We can figure out that the source vector is a 4 vector, because the continuity equation must hold in all reference frames. We know the gradients transform according to Lorentz transform, so the source vector must transform according to Lorentz transform as well. In order to rewrite the wave equations, we must first divide both sides of the equation for the electric potential by C, because the 4 potential contains the electric potential divided by C. We can eliminate epsilon 0 by using the expression for C squared. Now both equations have on the left side the entries of the 4 potential, and on the right side they have mu0 times the entries of the 4 current. Recalling that the wave equation can be written more compactly using the d'Alembertian operator, we can write Maxwell's equations using 4-factor notation. This notation emphasizes the fact that Maxwell's equations hold in all reference frames, just like Einstein's relativity postulates. This is because the d'Alembertian operator is Lorentz invariant, and the 4-factors on both sides both transform between reference frames according to Lorentz transform. So now we've seen several reasons for why the potentials may be considered more fundamental than the fields. Potentials are generated more straightforwardly than fields, they transform more elegantly between reference frames, and they allow for a much more compact description of Maxwell's equations, and in quantum mechanics it is found that the potentials, rather than the fields, interact with particles. But one thing remains odd. Recall that we can apply a gauge transformation to the potentials. This transformation can be written more compactly using 4-factor notation. The transformed potentials would still yield the same electric and magnetic fields, and so they would still make the same physical predictions. How can potentials be more fundamental than fields if they aren't even uniquely defined? Maybe there is also something fundamental about the gauge freedom that we have. This brings us to a brief comment on the importance of symmetries. Generally speaking, a symmetry is when something is the same after applying a transformation. For example, consider an equilateral triangle. The transformation we apply to it is a 60 degrees rotation. We now see that we end up with what we started with, so there is rotational symmetry. We can also apply another transformation, namely horizontally mirroring the triangle. Because the mirror triangle is the same as the original triangle, there is mirror symmetry. The study of electromagnetism has revealed two types of symmetry. Firstly, the principle of relativity postulates that the laws of physics, including the laws of electromagnetism, must be the same in all inertial frames of reference. We derive that therefore the laws of physics must be invariant under Lorentz transformation, which is a form of symmetry. Secondly, we saw that we could apply gauge transformations to the electromagnetic potentials, which leave the observables unchanged, which is another form of symmetry. The first is a global symmetry, because a single transformation is applied to the entire system. The second is a local symmetry, because each point can be transformed independently. These two kinds of symmetry both play important yet somewhat different roles in physics. We saw in our discussion of special relativity how we can derive laws of physics by postulating a global symmetry. Moreover, Noether's theorem relates global symmetries to conserved quantities. For example, systems with translational symmetry conserve momentum, systems with rotational symmetry conserve angular momentum, 
and systems with time symmetry conserve energy. Local gauge symmetries, on the other hand, do not relate to conserved quantities. Local gauge symmetries are relevant because if we require that the local gauge symmetry should hold, it puts constraints on the form of physical laws. For example, in quantum electrodynamics, we can derive how a quantum mechanical charged particle interacts with the electromagnetic field by postulating that the physics is invariant under a certain local gauge transformation. Nobel Prize winner David Gross remarked the following. The primary lesson of physics in this century is that the secret of nature is symmetry. Now let's summarize all we've seen about special relativity. The principle of relativity states that the laws of physics must be the same in all inertial reference frames. This idea was already proposed by Galileo, and it was later extended by Einstein. In Galilean relativity, electromagnetism is not taken into consideration whereas Einstein's relativity requires that the laws of electromagnetism must also be the same in all reference frames. As a consequence, in Einstein's relativity, the speed of light must be the same in all reference frames, whereas in Galilean relativity, the observed speed of light depends on your motion relative to the light source. Therefore, Galilean relativity is only valid for speeds that are negligible compared to the speed of light, because if you change the speed of light only by such tiny amounts, it is practically as if you assume that the speed of light is constant. But if we start to consider speeds that are comparable to the speed of light, then Galilean relativity breaks down, and we need Einstein's relativity to accurately describe the physics in different reference frames. If we want to understand in more detail how Einstein's relativity differs from Galilean relativity, we can introduce space-time diagrams. In Galilean relativity, we can move to a different reference frame by tilting the time axis, because the time axis corresponds to an object that is stationary in a certain reference frame. In Einstein's relativity, we have to make sure that the speed of light is the same in different reference frames, so we have to tilt the position axis along with the time axis. This is called the Lorentz transform, and it has several profound implications. It implies that if two events happen at the same time for one observer, they happen at different times for a moving observer. Two observers moving relatively to each other see each other's clocks tick more slowly than their own. They also see lengths in each other's systems contracted. Most importantly, the Lorentz transformation implies that information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Because if it could, then depending on your reference frame, the effect could happen before the cause. The principle of relativity requires that the laws of physics are the same in different reference frames. So now that to change the way we transform between reference frames, namely by Lorentz transform instead of Galilean transform, we also need to modify a few laws. Mass conservation becomes energy conservation, which implies mass energy equivalence, and momentum needs to be redefined. We can define a vector containing both the time and position coordinates, and this vector transforms between reference frames according to the Lorentz transform. Similarly, using the relativistic definitions of momentum and energy, we can define an energy-momentum vector that also transforms between reference frames according to the Lorentz transform. Vectors that transform between reference frames according to the Lorentz transform are called four vectors. We've also seen that different quantities may transform differently between different reference frames. There are contravariant vectors, such as position vectors, that transform contrary to the basis vectors. Covariant vectors, such as gradient vectors, transform along with the basis vectors. Invariant quantities don't change under a basis transformation. An inner product of a contravariant with a covariant vector gives an invariant quantity. Contravariant vectors are denoted using a superscript. Covariant vectors are denoted using a subscript. And in Einstein notation, repeated indices are summed over. We introduced a metric tensor to define the length of a vector in such a way that it is the same in all bases. According to relativity, all reference frames are equivalent, so the metric tensor must be the same in all reference frames. Knowing that we transform between reference frames by using the Lorentz transform, we can derive that the metric tensor is given by the Minkowski metric. The metric tensor can be used to convert contravariant vectors to covariant vectors, and vice versa. In other words, the metric tensor can raise and lower indices. The length of the position vector is given by the spacetime interval and the invariant length of the momentum vector gives us a relation between a particle's energy, mass and momentum.
It was the study of electromagnetism that led to Einstein's theory of special relativity. So it makes sense to look at what happens to electromagnetic fields in special relativity. To find out how the fields transform between reference frames, we use the fact that we know how trajectories of particles transform between reference frames, namely by Lorentz transform. We also know how the trajectory of a charged particle is determined by electromagnetic fields, namely through the Lorentz force. From this we can derive that the fields transform as an anti-symmetric 4x4 field tensor. We can also describe electromagnetism using potentials instead of fields. We can introduce the four potential that consists of the electric potential and the magnetic potential, and we can introduce the four current that consists of charge density and the current density. The continuity equation can be written compactly using Einstein notation, and if we assume that the potential satisfies the Lorentz gauge, then the behavior of the potentials are described by two wave equations. They can be written compactly using the D'Alembertian operator acting on the four potential. The wave equations for the potentials also reveal that the sources emit potentials at the speed of light. The way that sources generate potentials is much more straightforward than the way sources generate fields. Moreover, the aharonov bohm experiment reveals that quantum mechanical particles interact with potentials rather than fields. The idea that potentials are more fundamental than fields, even though potentials have a gauge freedom, leads to the idea that gauge freedoms, or symmetries in general, may be something fundamental as well.